Welcome to the Elk Talk Podcast with Randy Newberg and Corey Jacobson. Presented by the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. The goal is what little you and I know about elk hunting, we share with people. I've got an elk doing it's like 120 yards away. What do I do? First off, the thought would never cross my mind when an elk's being 120 yards away to call anybody on a cell phone. <laughs> All elk. All the time. Only elk. Only elk. Well, it's us having conversations. So we usually go down some rabbit holes. But if you hunt with Corey Jacobson, you will find the landscape is full of rabbit holes. We're just going to make this up as we go. And you look at it like, oh, that's a target rich environment. But if you're trying to single one out, a solo target there is much easier to go into than a, a big group. Well, we record everything, so there's no BS and no lying, no faking it with us. <laughs> Did we hit the record I button? I forgot to hit the record <laughs> button. If you want to know something about elk hunting, this probably isn't a podcast to listen to. <laughs> Could we give them a list of all the other podcasts wow. where they might learn something? <laughs> Hey folks, this is Randy Newberg. And I'm Corey Jacobson. And we are about ready to do what, Corey? Episode 11? I believe this is number 11. Number 11 of the Elk Talk podcast. And we've been on the road a lot lately, so it's really been hard for you and I to catch up. It has. We, uh, we talked earlier today that we launched this at, uh, right as we were getting ready for elk season, and then we were gone all of elk season, so it's been hard to kind of sit down and put some content into the headsets here, but we're getting back on schedule, right? Yep. Now <laughs> that uh, you've filled all your elk tags and I did the normal thing of me just buying elk tags and making a contribution to conservation, uh, <laughs> now we can get serious about telling the world what uh, our elk seasons have been like. Well, I so. don't know if they're going to be too excited to hear about that, but maybe we can tell them what an <laughs> ideal elk season would be like. Well, I got a lot of good stories about guest hunters, if That's that counts good. for anything. That, that definitely counts. Okay. But before we get into that, we better let the world know that Elk Talk Podcast is brought to you by the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, ensuring the future of elk, other wildlife, their habitat, and our hunting heritage. Become a member and go to rmef.org. That's right. And it's also sponsored by Sitka Gear. And Sitka Gear is actually, they're headquartered uh, over really close to you, aren't they? They are right next to my favorite coffee shop on North Rouse here in Bozeman. <laughs> Bozeman, Montana. And, uh, you know, I just, we had a, an opportunity to, to really put some of the gear to the test again this fall and... I just can't say enough about it's not camouflage. Yes, they're, the camo pattern is scientifically based, all of that, but the gear is what's the important part. And just being able to have gear you can rely on, clothing that's going to keep you comfortable in so many different uh, elements and conditions and just microclimates and everything. And to be able to you know leave the truck early in the morning when it's freezing cold and then go into hot weather throughout the day and have that clothing handle all of that and keep you dry and comfortable is vital so huge uh yeah huge proponent of sitka gear yeah and I, I hope when people listen to the last episode with john barclow that this guy could nerd out on clothing and the engineering of apparel like nobody's business <laughs> it's it's so cool to sit and talk to him sometime we need to have a live podcast with john and have the audience ask questions because that guy is a wealth of knowledge beyond any person I know in the clothing industry. And he's right there at Sitka. He's the he's a hunter who happens to be a I don't know if you if it's engineer or whatever, but the dude has it figured out. When when he talks, like on the last podcast when he was talking about synthetics versus down, I came home that evening and I went and bought a synthetic sleeping bag. <laughs> Based on John lecturing me, saying, I know you like your down and it's lighter and this and that, but when the fertilizer hits the ventilator, you want to have synthetic. Okay. <laughs> if John says so, I do it. Well, but I was going to say, he may not know what he's talking about, but he's awful convincing in talking about it. So 
That makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't, I haven't, John. <laughs> that was Corey saying that, not me. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, and I haven't been led astray yet, so I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt that he really does know what he's talking about. Uh, yeah, I think he does. And yeah. then uh, also, this podcast is brought to you by GoHunt.com. Uh, if you sign up for their Insider, uh, which is a huge part of my research and my strategy and my applications of how do I get tags, because the first step of producing all the video content we do is I need 10 to 12 tags a year. And GoHunt.com, their Insider service, is the place that has everything I need in one single place. And if you go there right now and sign up, you're going to get $50 of store credit in their gear shop if you use promo code ELKTALK. So go to GoHunt.com and sign up for the Insider. Use promo code ELKTALK. And it's like just having $50 of cash in your hand. Exactly. Plus, you get the value of the Insider membership, which I can't wait to dive into a lot more as we get closer to application season, which is right around the corner. I know it's weird, isn't it? it Hunting is. season's just barely ending, and then we got application season coming up. <laughs> just never stops. <laughs> the uh, podcast is also sponsored by OnX Maps, and they're not too far north of you there in Montana, but OnX Maps was probably the, if you look at uh, a, an item of gear that grew the most on me this year, it was OnX Maps. And yeah. we were on it continually. And I used to get after Donnie all the time because he'd be walking around, you know, posting something on Instagram or Facebook or doing things on his phone. Well, now we're on our phones all the time, but it's because we're looking at OnX Maps and just the ability to track where we've been. Donnie, Donnie tracked every single time we stepped out of the truck this season. He has a track saved on his phone. You can put different colors on them. And we're able to see exactly uh-huh. how far we hiked during elk season, which is really cool. Um, yeah. We used Onyx Maps, honestly saved the day when uh, Brinker had his broadhead incident that we talked about in episode nine. And we were able to find out what road led out of there to hit a road. And then we were able to describe that. We could send, we actually sent a pin to the guy who came and met us and said, we're going to come out right here, meet us here. And just so many benefits to uh, to that application. And the cool thing is, if you go to onxmaps.com and sign up for the the what is it, the hunt membership hunt app yep you're uh, you're going to save how much Randy 20% if and you what, use our promo code and what's the code that's so hard to remember i imagine that elk talk <laughs> elk talk is the discount code you'll save 20% when you sign up uh, at onxmaps.com yeah, can I put in a little shameless plug here? <laughs> of course. <laughs> Before we talk about Gerber, uh, right now we have a sweepstakes going with the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation and Onyx, where some unfortunate soul who wins the hunt is going to have to spend five days elk hunting with me next fall. So how, how does someone like myself sitting here at my computer right now, how would I enter that? You're not allowed to. What? But if you weren't Corey Jacobson, you would go to onxmaps.com and you'd click on the sweepstakes button. Are they Right now they have a little logo there. And all the details are right there, but someone's getting everything paid for. Tag, license, permit, travel. Sitka Gear is giving them a whole set of clothing. We're providing everything they need that they could possibly need for the hunt. We're going to loan it to them and we're going to film it. And uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. Somebody's going to win it. And you said I can't enter? Nope. Corey Jacobson's I'm, not allowed. I'm reading through the rules. I, I, don't, I, I, don't I see called anything. the RMEF and said, if you draw Corey Jacobson's number, throw that out and draw again. <laughs> Man. Well, think <laughs> of the grouse we could kill, though. Yeah. Anyhow, that's my shameless plug. I hope somebody listening wins it. It'll be a ton of fun. But the other uh, sponsor... We're getting to the end of them here is Gerber Gear. Not that they deserve to be at the bottom of any list. They're at the top of my list. Uh, We were out uh, elk hunting this week, and I got plenty of time to use my Gerber stuff. In fact, I shot a bison a couple weeks ago in Utah. You want to talk about work over your Gerber, work over your knife, the vital and the big game vital? Uh, That big game vital is built for things like bison and moose and elk. And so go to gerbergear.com. Or is it Gerber? I think it's gerbergear.com. I think, yeah, gerbergear.com. You would know that, wouldn't you? 
and find out about all the knives, tools, and other accessories uh, built for adventure. And uh, they're uh, a great sponsor of so many things that I do and of this podcast. We hope that people will uh, look into their products when the time comes to get knives and tools and other hunting accessories that you would use for, as I call it, the gutting and gilling. <laughs> so, <laughs> the important gerbergear.com is the place to go. Awesome. And then last and uh, again, not least, is Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls. And uh, just, you know, I, I we're coming out with a new diaphragm call next spring through Elk 101 with Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls and had a chance to really test the prototype during elk season this year. And I couldn't tell you how many... We had to be in the thousands of bugles. We, we didn't hear as many bugles as we gave out, but we gave out a lot of bugles. And uh, just having an elk call that performs time after time and last is just, it's been, you know, it, it's obviously I've been associated with them for a long time, but I've also used other calls here and there. And, and having a call that just is consistent and last has that longevity is so handy because I don't want to carry four or five different diaphragms with me, especially if we're going away from the truck for a couple of weeks. And Rocky Mountain yeah. Hunting Calls uh, definitely performs in all of those important areas. So if someone wants to save 15% on their Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls. They would just go to the website at RockyMountainHuntingCalls.com or BuglingBull.com and use the discount code, get ready for it, Elk Talk. Yeah. <laughs> Drum roll. <laughs> elk uh, talk is the promo code to remember just go around to random websites and just enter elk talk it may work on, on <laughs> don't platforms. say that because uh, <laughs> Sika here and rmef both called me and said are you giving a promo code for us i'm like no <laughs> i think it's because on my other podcast i made a joke of when in doubt use this promo code <laughs> <laughs> that's Oops. awesome and, and just Sorry a little about that. shameless plug on my part we're going to be launching destination elk which is a day-by-day -day video series of our entire elk season uh, coming up on november 12th and we'll be giving away during that series every day of the series we'll be giving away a bully bull extreme bugle tube from rocky mountain hunting calls and that's going to come oh. with the sitka subalpine tube cover and one of the brand new diaphragms that we'll be coming out with. They're not even going to be available to the public until January or February of next year, but we're going to have some uh, to give away through that video series. So that's, that'll be on the Elk 101 YouTube channel starting on November 12th every day until our season is done. You'll be able to follow along cool. and see what we did, including, so, including watching David Brinker stick a broadhead in his leg and uh, hmm. the backcountry first aid and rescue that went on there i i think that's going to be your most highly viewed episode it's almost <laughs> like nascar you know people watch it because they want to see a wreck exactly <laughs> but people watch Corey on elk 101 because they want to see a guy jab himself with a broadhead man i don't ever want to see that again <laughs> uh well <clears throat> we sure got a ton of comments on episode nine that you did with david i i don't know if we can answer them all i i think one of our if what it tells me is we have to bring onto the podcast someone who is super skilled in first responder type backcountry emergency first aid type stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Like a military medic, you know, something like that where they've, you know, been in situations where time is of the essence and, and, and know what to do to save a life because we didn't know what, I mean, uh, we did fine. I, I, I downplayed a little bit. We kept calm. We knew we had to stop the bleeding, all of these things, but we certainly weren't prepared for something like that. I am now. And in fact, you know, one of the common emails we've gotten over the last week is what are the products that you bought for your first aid kit after this incident and where can we find them? So um, yeah. we can talk a little bit about that here in a minute as well. Yeah, we should just jump right into that because yeah. quite a few of the questions that came from Instagram or uh, the Elk Talk podcast website were related to what was the list of things. And uh, after I listened to it, I ran right on down to the store and I got myself some of that quick clot stuff. Is yep. that what it's called? Quick, quick clot? Quick clot, yep. It's just, uh, it's impregnated, uh, basically gauze, 
And, you know, I, I mentioned in the podcast in episode nine that you basically wrap the gauze around the wound and the, mm-hmm. uh, I don't even know how to pronounce the, the stuff that's in it, but it, uh, it gets in there and it clots blood five times faster. So it helps stop that bleeding. And I had several guys say, if the hole's big enough that you can push gauze into it, stuff that hole with the gauze. Don't just wrap it with it because that blood's going to keep coming out. Make contact with the, with the stuff that's impregnated into the gauze down inside the wound and it'll stop it even faster. So quick wow. clot was, was the number one item we got. And then I got the uh, SWAT T tourniquets and we've got a lot of comments on those. There's also a, a CAT, a cat tourniquet and uh, some other different tourniquets. The reason I went with the SWAT T was because it's a little more versatile. You can use it, a, a, use it as a compression wrap or you can use it as a tourniquet. And so you can, you know, in our situation, we didn't need an actual tourniquet we just needed something to hold a lot of pressure on that wound and stop the bleeding. And, you know, yeah. an actual tourniquet, you know, you could say, you could fashion it to do the same thing. This is actually a stretchy material. It's got little diamonds or little shape patterns on the side of it. And so when you stretch it to a certain point, then it becomes a tourniquet. And it, you know, by that shape, as it changes shape, uh, as that, you know, changes form, you're able to tell that you've got it to tourniquet level and it's no longer just a compression wrap. So I got that just because it'll work for both. It's probably not the best tourniquet, you know, something that's a little mm-hmm. more robust that you can twist right down on and, and stop blood flow um, is probably going to be better. Um, but with the versatility and not having to carry two of them, I felt that was, was uh, the way to go. And then the third one was the zip stitch and it's so cool. I hope I never have to use it, but if I do, I hope I get to use it on somebody else just so I get to pull the little, uh, little cords on it. But basically it's, it's kind of like a butterfly bandage, but it's also like Mm -hmm. those, uh, what are the little zip ties? Yeah. It basically has four zip ties. You, you put the adhesive on both sides of the wound and then you pull the four zip tied cords through the, the little slots on it and it pulls those two adhesive sides together and basically closes that wound. So if you get like a knife cut that's an inch or two long, instead of getting the stitches, you can put that on it, zip it down, and it basically closes it right up. You bandage it and they say it's cleaner than stitches. It'll heal without a scar. Uh, it doesn't have the pain of stitches. So those are the three products cool. I got. I think I got... Uh, the quick clot and the SWAT T tourniquet off of Amazon. And I bought the zip stitch directly from their website. And I've got links. Mm. If you go out to elk101.com, I wrote a quick little article on the incident with links to, to what's now in my first aid kit for hunting. Yeah. Well, I don't know if we're, if I'm supposed to say this yet, but the day before David's episode, the, uh, Oh, it might have been a week before episode nine aired. Uh, a guy I know, Brian Holcomb, got a hold of me, and he gave me all kinds of stats about Colorado emergency room visits made by hunters between 1997 and 2005. There was a study done by it's the Wilderness Medical Society. Here's the most common trauma diagnosis: uh, lacerations were number one at 151 of the 725, and 113 were from accidental knife injuries, mostly while hunters were field dressing their big game animals. Yep, I believe that. That was what what he sent me, and he said, oh, and by the way, <clears throat> we have this... Uh, Adventure Medical Kit, uh, the Sportsman Series that we're getting ready to release in 2019, spring of 19. So, Brian, if I'm letting the cat out of the bag here, I'm sorry about that, but uh, he sent me one. You heard it first on the Elk Talk podcast. (laughs) Yeah, he sent me one, and I have it, and it's organized so well. It's got a a wilderness first aid comprehensive guide about, uh, it's got like 50 i think techniques uh and for me it's got a hunt over a hundred pictures which is helpful for a guy with my <laughs> reading impairment uh for treating uh pretty much the whole range of outdoor uh, related injuries and illnesses uh it's organized very well it's got a lot of glow in the dark stuff so i i'm thinking that some hunters 
had a lot of input in this because a lot of times we have, you know, you shoot the bull right at dark and you, if you do have an injury, as many of them, as they say, are related to uh, lacerations from knife, knife injuries, uh, that would, uh, the, the, the seeing in the dark or, or making it, what do you call that when you can see something in the dark, reflective or whatever the term is. <laughs> Blue in the dark uh, or reflective, yeah. Yeah, seems like it would be uh, pretty helpful. But so I, to David Brinker's credit, as much as it probably didn't feel good, I think what people saw on your website, on your uh, uh, Instagram page about all that, and then from the last podcast with David, um, maybe the good of it is that we're more aware and more prepared. Totally. No, and I think that was it. You know, aside from Brinker's Instagram account doubling overnight, um, <laughs> yeah, I think the awareness that it, that it, just a reminder for all of us, you know, I had, I have a big first aid kit and it's pretty much mm -hmm. worthless. It's, it's pretty much for comfort. If I get a blister, if I get a scratch, if I get a burn, if I, you know, it, it's got, right. I have super glue. That's probably the most powerful um, weapon I have in there as far as, as first aid and taking care of that. What I realized was you don't need those kind of things in an emergency, none of that stuff is going to do any good. And we honestly didn't use a thing. There wasn't a single thing in my first aid kit that got used when David cut himself. Wow. So it's, it's That's good, a, a good reminder that be prepared for the really bad thing. You know, don't go out and carry a stretcher around with you or anything like that, but <laughs> take some precautions to, to be prepared for when things go like we none of us expect will happen. I, I never thought, you know, I'm careful. I, I watch my steps. I do all these things to make sure I don't get hurt, but you just, you can't prevent accidents all the time. And yeah, it's bound to happen well, at some level. For me, I know you laughed when we were in New Mexico and when you shot that elk, I broke out my Benadryl. That's, that's the one thing in my backpack first aid kit that I use a lot of is my Benadryl because I'm allergic to deer, elk, and antelope blood and fur. That so. is just a, a <laughs> cruel punishment to deliver to somebody, but a hunter who's allergic to deer, elk, and antelope blood and hair. That's yeah. just... And if I don't take my Benadryl, whew, it gets... Uh, I don't know. I, if there's some uh, allergist listening to this... They're probably saying, Newberg, you idiot. Benadryl eventually isn't going to be enough. You're going to tip over out there. <laughs> oh, well. Some of my wife asked me, well, what if you die out there when you're hunting? I have, my response always is, well, there's some things worth dying for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, oh, no, and I, always, I will tip over. And people are like, Newberg, you didn't have to take it literally. <laughs> well, <clears throat> But on this podcast, Corey, I think a couple things we wanted to cover, and we could probably do full-blown episodes and a huge detail about some of these questions we've been getting on the Elk Talk podcast uh, feedback link. I, I call it a feedback link. I should look here at what the button is where uh, people can say, hey, I have this question. Uh, oh, contact us. There we go. Imagine <laughs> that. Yeah, contact us. <clears throat> but uh, we got a question from Chris Paulson in Colorado. And he says, uh, hey, guys, I've been listening to Randy talk about the five periods of elk hunting, early season, pre-rut, peak rut, post-rut, and late season. And he always talks about how to find bulls in those hunting seasons. I live in Colorado, and I can get a bull tag and a cow tag. Yet, I still at times struggle just finding cows. Would you guys mind addressing how to find cows in the five different parts of the season? I know Randy always says food and water, but are there any specific strategies by season? That would be helpful. Thanks, Chris. Huh. <laughs> Who, who, who gets to jump into that one? Man, I, I was going to say, I, if we're, if we're going to tackle hunting cows in all five seasons, finding cows and hunting cows in all five seasons, I think that's probably a full podcast right there. Yeah, yeah, um, I, I think it is. But I, when, when he says, Randy always says food and water. Uh, <laughs> what else is there? That, 
Yeah, I, I mean, that is a general statement, but it's also a correct statement. And a pretty complete but, like, statement. The, this last weekend was the opening of rifle season in Montana. The elk are in post-rut mode. The bulls are mostly separated from the cows, either solo and or in small bachelor groups. And just observing the location of where the groups were relative to each other, the bulls were in the nasty canyons, almost avalanche shoot type stuff. And the cows were on the open blown ridges that were free of snow because that's where the best food was. And to say where the best food is, is going to be a different location where we were at 9,000 feet in Montana in October versus where the best food is in Arizona in December or the best food is in Colorado in November. What uh, The point of me saying that is know what the primary food source is for elk in the area you're hunting. It can range from grasses to forbs to browse. And then once you know what it is in your area, go and look for that. And those are the places you're going to find cows because a cow is either, a year round is either lactating or incubating, one or the other. And they need the best food on the landscape And they've become very good at finding where the best food is. And all other things being equal, they want the best food in the place where they're least likely to be disturbed. But they don't go to anywhere near the extreme that the bulls go to in response to hunting pressure. Definitely, yeah. That's Randy's version. No, and I, I couldn't agree more. I've actually had the chance to take my kids out here the last week or two rifle hunting and it's a completely different game finding elk right now in the post rut than it was just two weeks ago and it's just you know if you don't know where those feed sources are they're just (laughs) the elk are going to be where the feed is and i think you know there's so many different um habitats between you know starting on the Oregon coast, coming over to Idaho, getting into Wyoming, and then going down into Nevada and New Mexico and Arizona and some of those states, there's so many diverse habitats and so many diverse feed sources for elk that, you know, it'd it'd be really hard for us to say, okay, go look for this feed source because that's, it's only going to work in some states. I think it'd be great to get a biologist on and talk, you know, one that knows all of those different feed sources in different states and, and kind of talk about what what the elk are doing throughout different times of the year, where you're going to find them based on those feed sources. Yeah. It's for me and, and people, this is another question is Randy, you've talked about this book by Jack Ward Thomas, but on Amazon, the price is $600. <laughs> well, the wildlife management Institute, you go there, wildlife management Institute, uh, it might even be wildlife management dot Institute, I think is their URL. Uh, it's, uh, uh, by Jack Ward Thomas, it's elk, eco- North American elk, ecology and management. And they've just brought it back into print. Now, some people blame that on me, but I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> Jack Ward Thomas, who passed recently is just an expert on this stuff. And he has spent a lot of his career before he was, the chief of the Forest Service, a lot of his career was studying elk as a Forest Service uh, land manager. And for 85 bucks, you can get that book at WMI. But the, the reason I say that is I learned more about the preferences of elk forage by reading that book and those studies than any book, anything I've, I've ever read. So... That's one place to start. Yep. So just Starting. a couple things on that. The uh, If you go to, I'm at wildlife-management-institute, mm-hmm. and you can buy it for $42.50. Oh, really? Yeah. So I, I actually, I, I ordered version. one. I ordered a, a copy right after we talked about it in episode one, and holy huh. cow. I couldn't even imagine sitting down and writing that much. It's 962 pages. And yeah. These aren't little pages. They're huge pages and they're, the font, it's, man, this isn't a kid's coloring book by any means. I was, I didn't have much use for it, but the, uh, just the, 
the amount of information, the detailed information in every single aspect of elk ecology is mind blowing. You could you could study that book for the rest of your life and not learn everything that's contained in there about elk. Yeah. Huh. Well, I had some old link. I don't I was just reading that off. Read that link again. Uh let me see if I I'm gonna see if I can go to Wildlife Management Institute and just see if there's a link on there directly to it. Okay. Because the the website is wildlife management dot institute. Okay. But then if you click yeah, to buy the book, it takes you to a Shopify account. So okay. Just, Publications. All right. Here it is. Oh, $42.50. There you go. Huh. I just, I, yeah, I you, saved you 50%. Don't yeah. buy the so book from Amazon. On. If you're listening, do not buy the book from Amazon. It's $266 is the cheapest one on Amazon right now. Yeah. So click on Publications, go to Books, and there you'll see it right there. North American Elk, Ecology and Management. Because we've had a ton of questions of people saying, where is that book? I don't want to pay Amazon some, <laughs> whatever the dollar amount was. Yep. But uh, And, and this cool. is not, we're not affiliated in any way. We don't get a penny out of this. This is a, we want to save you money for listening. Yeah. So North American Elk, Ecology and Management at Wildlife Management Institute. Just make sure it's the one written by Jack Ward Thomas and... $42. Don't yeah. pay more than $42 for it. Yeah. I, I think if people read that and some are going to say 962 pages, what do you think I have the rest of my life <laughs> to study elk? Well, I, it really is an investment in your elk hunting skills, talent, knowledge, whatever you want to call it. And I spent I don't know how many times I read that book. And then I've loaned it out to somebody. Whoever has my Jack Ward Thomas book, would you return it to me? <laughs> <laughs> I loaned it out. Now I don't have Maybe that's one of the ones for sale on Amazon. Exactly. It's Randy Newberg's book. <laughs> <laughs> if if you see my name on the inside cover, <clears throat> please let me know. <laughs> you know, that'd be the one to buy because you probably have all the important pages, like the corners of them turned down. So I could just flip through to those instead of having to read all 962 pages. <clears throat> there you go. Or the ones that have the toilet paper in between a page or something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even want to know. Uh, we'll leave that one for a different yeah. time. But <clears throat> now I had so, another, I had another, are we ready to move on? Yeah, let's, uh, <clears throat> I, I think we covered the cow elk one as good as we can in, in a, a Q&A session rather than doing a whole podcast about it. But maybe the audience wants us to do a whole podcast. About I think, it. you know, just looking at the number of antlerless tags available versus antlered tags, um, especially post rut late season. I really think that there's, you know, as, as many people are out hunting antlerlesses are hunting antlered elk each season. And I think it would be really worthwhile to talk about uh, maybe more detail about where to find the cows in each season um, because it does change. You know, they're obviously looking for feed, mm -hmm. but feed's going to change throughout the year. Um, they're, they are going to be looking for security, especially when they're having their calves. Uh, maybe we can talk about some of that movement and then talking about hunting tactics because that's probably yeah. one of the, since we, since we launched the University of Elk Hunting online course two years ago, the number one missing piece from that course is a module on how to hunt cows. And I'm hoping to yeah. add that in the next couple of months to it because uh, I'm going to have an opportunity hopefully here in about three weeks to shoot my first cow elk of my lifetime. So I will actually have experience and be able to provide uh, a little bit more. I mean, I see cows every year. I could shoot cows every year, but I've never hunted one. I've never shot one. And yeah. I think it'll maybe give me a little bit of relevance when I talk about it that I've actually done it now. So, but I think we could do a yeah. full podcast on hunting cow elk and, uh, and touch a lot of people that, that hunt in that way each fall. Yeah. This, this weekend here with the Montana rifle opener, I could have shot quite a few cow elk, but I was sitting there saying, well, I don't know. I, 
I shot a bison, even though I'm splitting that with the four other guys with me. We split that five ways. I got quite a bit in my freezer, and my son has an elk tag, and my uncle has an elk tag. And since I'm the guy who does the gutting and gilling, I usually end up with a lot of their meat. Well, now my uncle can't make the hunt. My son, who knows if he's going to flake out on me. Now I'm like, why didn't I shoot that cow elk? That was stupid, Randy. <laughs> but it's... uh for me, uh, when I see people out cow hunting, I get pretty excited because it brings me back to the idea of why my family was so connected to hunting to start with, and that was the food concept. Totally. It was just it was what we ate. So I, I've talked to your dad before, Corey, and he was telling me when he grew up, I think it would be your grandfather or whatever, how his dad pretty much instructed him, you shoot cow elk. Don't be shooting bulls. Shoot cows. Yep. <laughs> if you shoot a bull, you're packing it out and eating it by yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Which I think is cool. And uh, I I enjoy it. Like this last weekend, we watched this cow uh, and she disappeared over the ridge. And then we heard kaboom, walked over there and here a guy had shot her and he was dragging her out and quartering her up. So I was going to say he's dragging yeah, I, her out. <laughs> What's that? He, he was dragging a, an elk out? Well, he was dragging it down. He shot it in this really steep spot. He drug it down about, a, I don't know, 150 vertical feet okay. to get to a flatter spot to work on it. And uh, But I, I think it would be worthwhile. I'd be interested uh, to see if more people want information about cow elk hunting. And maybe we bring a biologist on who can speak in more detail because in, in archery season, I, I see plenty of cow elk also, but the bulls are what give away their presence for the most part. Totally. And that's, that's what I tell people all the time. If you're hunting cow elk during archery season, which most states, um, if you have an archery tag, it's typically good for either sex. And obviously know the regulations don't just go off of what I'm saying here, but um, several states you can shoot a cow uh, during the archery season. And I've had opportunities every year while I'm solely focused on chasing the bulls, I've had opportunities to shoot cows. So I tell people all the time, if you're cow hunting, just go hunt like you're hunting a bull and you'll have an opportunity. Find the herd, the bull's going to be bugling, there's going to be cows there. Get in close and make it happen. And obviously mm -hmm. there's a lot more detail that goes in between those lines <laughs> there, but <laughs> but I would if I if I did have a cow tag and was hunting just strictly for cows during the rut, I would take my bugle tube and I would hunt them just like I was hunting bulls. I'd hunt bulls, I would just shoot cows. Yeah. Uh, that sounds like pretty much the way I'd do it. And in the fall or, or the late fall of this post rut season, it it changes a little bit in that you just have to think about the fact that the the bulls are looking for sanctuary they're looking to survive because the, in most places that's what gets the most focus of hunting pressure and the cows don't have quite that pressure yeah they like to be undisturbed but they have one task get my calf through to next winter and keep this fetus growing until next spring and the way i do that is find the best food i can and that's, yeah. I, I know that sounds oversimplified, but it's, if you think about it through that lens, it leads you to, okay, what is the best food and where do I find that best food? And once I find that best food, I'm going to find those cows. Yep. And so. it's, you know, I mean, we, I don't know that we need to even, if, if you're, obviously the book that we talked about is going to have a lot more information on actual feed, but just understand when we hunted Roosevelt elk this year in Oregon, a lot of the canopy we were in, that old growth stuff, there wasn't a, it was sterile under there. There was no feed in that area. So mm -hmm. as beautiful as it was and as, as fun as it was to be there and look at and take pictures in, we weren't going to find elk there. There's just no way because there's no feed. And you get over into the areas where there's clear cuts, you know, where they went in and logged it. That creates feed. That opens that canopy up and lets the, the feed come to the surface and the elk, that's where you're going to find them. You know, if you're in an area like that where there's the thick old growth and there's no real nutritional beneficial feed in there, you're going to need to go somewhere where the, the sunlight's going to be able to touch the ground and actually produce some feed for the elk. And so just understanding that, you know, here where we're, where we're at in central Idaho, there's a lot of feed in a lot of places. So yeah. it's a little bit more difficult to, 
narrow down just a feed source, then you've got to start looking at, okay, where are they safe? Where are they going to be safe through different times of the year in addition to feed? Um, there's a lot of water here too. And so it, it does. I know yep. when we hunted Montana, it was, it looked like the entire state was beautiful elk habitat, but we'd walk miles and miles and not see an elk or see any sign. And then all of a sudden you'd get in a pocket and there'd be elk there. And it looked just the same as the rest of the pockets we'd walked through, but for whatever reason, that's where they were. Yeah. Well, this, uh, this time of year for me anyhow, and I think the statistics show that it would be true is this post rut period is the hardest time to shoot a bull elk on public land. The success rates are the lowest. And that's why states with a lot of general hunting, Colorado, Montana, Idaho, Wyoming can have these mid to late October rifle seasons and the bulls still have a survival rate. It just, it's a tough time to find them. Yep. No, I mean, it's, they're just, it, once they leave the herds, they go to those little pockets and unless you know where those pockets are, because year after year, it's usually the same areas. If you've got a ridge that you see elk on this time of year, there's a good chance you're going to see them on it next year. And, and it just takes a while, I think, to find those areas. But I couldn't agree yeah. with you more that this time of year, finding a bull on public land, especially on a general tag, especially if you're looking for a mature bull, it's a needle in a haystack. Yeah. And I always tell people that if you find a sanctuary on public land that bulls are using year after year after year, don't tell anybody where it is. <laughs> Drive to the trailhead with your you know, your boss's truck or something. Do not let anyone know where that is because once people find out, the gig's over. You're, you're going to just have people there and it's no longer going to be a safe place or a sanctuary that these bulls feel comfortable in. Yep. If it doesn't get harassed all the time, you can usually go back consistently year after year unless something dramatic changes in the landscape or the habitats or the migrations or whatever. But in most instances, you can go there year after year. And if you put in your time glassing and hunting in there, you will find elk in those, bull elk in those same general areas, which is why I, I don't give out a lot of spots as it relates to post-rut locations. Uh, in, the, in the peak of the rut, yeah, it, the elk are moving so much, there's not a, yeah, at least in Montana, there's not what I would say a specific hot spot because they're just moving all the time. This time of year, uh, if you see me driving my wife's Honda CRV, um, <laughs> I'm probably going incognito. <laughs> you got a, a uh, Honda CRV with a coexist sticker in the back window, and yeah, yeah. something like that. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, you know, it it the bumper sticker isn't the one of happiness is a steaming gut pile. I can assure you that. <laughs> <Yeah>. but, <laughs> Uh, well talking uh, talking about feed and uh feed sources i've got a a question here that was sent in from lewis shetler and he's it's kind of a longer email but in a nutshell he said looking for some insight on free range livestock effects on elk primarily september Mm. rutting elk i'm from washington and new to the free ranging idea looking for an excuse of why i couldn't get it done this year but also looking for some wisdom on this subject um, basically said he went to an area last year, there were elk all over in there, went back this year and it was, there was nothing during September. And he said he noticed that there had been sheep in the area. So I think, uh, oh. that, and you and I, I don't remember if we've talked about it on this podcast. I know we've talked about it before, but sheep are, yeah. you know, we call yeah. them land maggots because they just, they, <sighs> they just, they're little white bumps that just move over the whole area and they eat everything down to the dust and there is no available feed left once a a big herd of sheep goes through and i'm talking you know big ranging herds of sheep like thousands of sheep go through an area and it just churns up the soil and there's nothing there but sandy soil left there's not even anything green sticking up out of it and the elk will not stay they can't stay there's no feed they won't you know i think aside from the fact that there's noise all the time and they stink and, you know, the elk can't use their nose. They can't hear as well. They're going to get out of there just so they're safe, but there's no available feed. And so if you are in an yeah. area where there's sheep uh, being ranged through there or grazed through there, uh, 
my my advice would be pick up and move and go away from where the sheep are and where they've been. Yep. And if you look at the difference in how sheep graze versus how cattle graze, it's what you said. Cattle usually are not going to mow it right down to, it looks like the surface of the moon or something. Uh, cattle usually don't graze as intensely. And I've seen, uh, and this is not science, but it's just my observation. I've seen elk be displaced by cattle grazing also, but not nearly to the degree that... Uh, sheep grazing well and usually when i see cattle grazing the elk still find places on you know right next to the allotment or just over the allotment fence or in the steeper places that the cattle really stay away from that the elk will still be in there so i my experience has been that cattle grazing is not nearly as uh I, I guess, disruptive to elk patterns as sheep grazing is. Yep, and I agree. Cattle can definitely overgraze and then affect and displace elk. But for the most part, with what we see in free range with the cattle, uh, the elk will still be there. Yeah, when when we were in New Mexico, it was an early season this year, but it was quite remarkable. There was a an active allotment that had cattle on it. And we were walking along the allotment fence and my uncle Jimmer from Alaska was with and he'd never elk hunted before. And he said, why is there so much feed on this side? And uh, it looks like it never rained over on the other side. And it was <laughs> quite obvious that, well, one side had the cattle grazing on it and it, yeah, there's a reason why we saw a lot more elk sign and uh, just general elk activity on the side without the cattle allotment. But yep. uh, next year, when they swap that, a lot of times they have these rotational allotments. Next year, they might move the cattle over to the, the side that had most of the elk this year, and the elk might end up on the other side. So understand that allotments aren't necessarily always the same. Uh, if you are in a place with heavy grazing pressure, it might be good to call the Forest Service or BLM office in that area and ask which of the allotments are active at that time and make your plan accordingly. Definitely. So with that, uh, so I have a question have, for you. This, this wasn't okay. one that was sent yeah. in, but today we're recording this. It's October 24th. By the time it's released, we're going to be into November. So kind of yep. away from post rut, more into late season, but I yep. think more for my curiosity, and I'm sure there are others that, that want to know, and we get a lot of emails about, you know, I'd, Got second season rifle tag in Colorado. Are calls effective? Um, even first yeah. season rifle in Colorado are calls effective. You've been out in the woods chasing elk now for a bit. Have you heard any bugles the last week? Yeah. <laughs> it's funny you ask that. Uh, we were uh, out, uh, or I was out, just driving around doing some scouting. When was it? October... I think 10th or 11th, something like that. And there was still quite a bit of bugling going on. This last weekend, season opened on Saturday the 20th. I didn't hear a bugle. Now, Bo, the guy with us, opening morning, he heard a bugle and he went over there and there was this bull in with a group of cows and he ended up shooting that bull. After opening day, Nobody heard a bugle anywhere. The, the little bit of bugling that was there either got the bull shot or he heard all the shooting and said, I think I'll just keep my mouth shut from here on out. So I, I brought my bugle tube with me, uh, but I ended up not using it just because I, I was not hearing anything. I, I thought I might hear a little bugling action. Uh, on October 20th, but I, I didn't, which isn't too far out of the norm. You know, you get the, in Colorado, you have the second season that I think, when does that open? This, or it might be open right now. I just say, I think it's, I yeah, think, just yeah, after mid-October. I, I think it might be open right now. And then they get a week break and then they have the third season. And in the second and third seasons in Colorado, I probably wouldn't bother uh, too much with calling. Now the first rifle season in Colorado, which I think this year opened October 13th or something like that. Uh, I'd be calling then. I've, I've heard a lot of elk bugling October 10th through the 15th. Yep. And I've heard, I mean, we've, we've heard them. Well, 
two years ago, three years ago now, I guess, uh, my son Isaac, I took him out. He was 12, and it was about this date, October 23rd, 24th, somewhere in there. And we were hiking in on this closed logging road and got out on a point and heard a bugle back behind us. And my first thought was, that's another hunter. Because it's October 23rd, 24th. You just don't hear bugles on, on their own that time of year. And we stood there for 30 seconds and it bugled again. And I was able to hear it well enough to know that it wasn't a hunter. And we ended up getting up on the ridge and there was a full-fledged bugle fest going on. No other hunters in there. There was a herd of probably 50 or 60 cows with a couple spikes in there. And the six point that he ended up shooting was screaming his head off on his own. We didn't even have to bugle. In fact, I don't think I did bugle uh, that morning, they ended up going around into the canyon. So we got over and got set up where we could glass across and shoot across the, the draw there. And I bugled a couple times and we sat there for probably 15 or 20 minutes, never heard a thing. The cows and the spikes were out on the open hill feeding, but the bull wasn't there. And all of a sudden the bull appeared straight across the hillside from us. She just came out and was looking over on our hillside to see where the bugle had come from. It was three thirty, four o'clock in the afternoon. So I wouldn't have expected him to bugle. Uh, but he definitely mm-hmm. was interested in the calls and had been bugling all that morning. So, you know, I think it depends on the area, the pressure they're getting, uh, depends on the year when the rut actually kicks in, the weather has a, an effect on that. This year I've been working my tail off trying to find elk to, to take my kids out to rifle hunt. And I thought it was going to be a slam dunk because three days before rifle season opened, I had three bulls located that were all bugling very freely. One of them in 30 or 40 minutes of sitting there bugled 25 times. Wow. And I thought, okay, this is this is the one. It's in a place nobody else is going to be here. We're coming back opening morning. And I actually hiked in there the night before and bugled just to make sure he was still there and never heard a peep. And we ended up going back in there <laughs> opening morning, never heard a peep. So then I scrambled and wow. went to my other two backup areas not a peep in either of them. So I'm, I'm pretty certain the elk get some kind of a text notification that says, oh, season opens tomorrow, <laughs> quit bugling. You're going to kill all of us. Yeah. Just go quiet and move away. Well, maybe they download the regulations and check it out. There's but something. The, the funny part of that is, is in 2013, my son and I were in central Montana. And I don't know if it's something about prairie elk or if it's something about how large some of these herds get with these prairie areas, but we shot two bulls out of the same herd in about five minutes apart on Halloween, October 31st, and they were screaming their brains out. It was just crazy how much bugling was going on. We're walking in in the dark, getting to the area that we'd glassed. We'd glassed from this big knob the night before and saw this herd. And in the dark, we you didn't have to use your GPS or anything. It's just, here's where they are. You could hear them. And we got right there and here they come to their bedding area, just going after it. So it's, yeah. I can't explain why some years or in one pocket here or one pocket there, you run into some cows that must still be in a late cycle and cause this craziness. But it's it's not a strategy I would build my hunt around based on how sporadic it is. No, but I think uh, my I might build my hunt strategy around trying to find one that bugles. Because, man, if you can find a bull that bugles when you're rifle hunting... <laughs> I don't know how much yeah. easier you could get an elk hunt right there, but that's why uh, I think rifle hunting is so difficult because those bulls usually do quit bugling and they move off by themselves and they don't move much and it makes it tough. But man, if you can find one bugling, that's, uh, like I said, I, I spent a week scouting just looking for bulls that were bugling so I could get my kids back in there and have a chance because I certainly am not an accomplished rifle hunter by any means. But well, that plan failed. Thanks. So now we're now we're back to hunting elk like everybody else. <laughs> oh, well, it's uh, for me anyhow. the The odds of me finding an elk this time of year that's bugling is is a less likely than finding one bugling. Uh, yep. But it's by the time this podcast airs. We're going to be into November, which I say November 1st is the start of the late season, which for me, late season is a glassing game. 
It is all about glass, glass, glass. Find yourself in the best possible locations you can. Someplace, hopefully, you can glass multiple areas uh, and get ready for a long session behind the optics. And it's some people think it's boring, and yeah, it might be boring, but this time of year, for me anyhow, it's... It's the most effective thing I've found. You, some guys are, are really good at waiting until it snows and then they follow a fresh track through the snow, maybe in and out of the dark timber. And that certainly works. But for me to consistently find where these bulls are at on public land, it's a glassing game in the late season. And I, I say November 1st until whenever your season ends, uh, some go into December. Uh, that's, that's just optics time for me. Yep. I agree. Which gets to, uh, a question we had from Arthur Tang. He said, uh, when it comes to glassing, Corey talks about North facing slopes. Randy talks about, about facing North and glassing slopes on the Southeast or Southwest. I wonder how to interpret this discrepancy. Is it a rut versus sanctuary or just a hunter preference? situation <laughs> um i think it might be uh, I, at least for me I, I don't do a lot of glassing and i probably would never have a need to glass a north face um, yeah. when i talk about north faces i'm talking about bedding areas and that's where we like to go to follow the elk especially in the rut uh, to call them but yeah I, I don't spend much if any time ever glassing a north face a north facing yeah. slope and for me, I uh, uh, the way I talk about it is I set up and I like to have the sun at my back. So sometimes that has me in the morning looking west and I might be looking at the, the east. So I'm looking west. It's an east facing slope. It might be the southeast. It might be the northeast. It might be straight east. Sometimes if I can, I'll hedge my bet and I'll sit on a knob and I'll be looking straight north so I I can see most of the the east slope of a drainage and most of the west slope of a drainage and maybe that's maybe it's the way I'm explaining it that has created a discrepancy uh in in what the person asked here but for me it's uh, and then they asked is this a rut versus sanctuary uh issue in the rut I hardly, I do so little glassing, kind of like you said, uh, yep. in the late season, post rut, late season, that's when I glass. Uh, so I, I don't know that it's a hunter preference and I'm seldom glassing to the south into north facing slopes. Sometimes I will, but in most instances, those north facing slopes usually are so thick, you can't even glass into them. So I'm, if it's something that's just a thick carpet for, you know, a mile of dark timber on a north facing slope. I I don't even waste my time glassing in there. I'll move somewhere where I can glass the fringes or where that dark timber starts to thin out or change in a vegetation pattern to a a different type of vegetation, one of those fringe or edge areas, or I'll find some places, whether it's avalanche chutes or burns or logging or thinning operations. I'm looking for edges where, yeah, the bulls might go into the dark timber to bed, but they have to come out and eat sometime during the day or night. So they're not going to be that far from the, the edge areas where the, the food is. Yep. And, and obviously, and again, they look for the, the rough, terrible, nasty country that I don't want to. I always say, do I really want to shoot an elk that bad? <laughs> <laughs> and then you see one there and you, you say, yeah, I do. Yeah. No, I just, you, I, you mentioned something there that honestly I've never even thought of, but it's being strategic in the direction that you're glassing. Obviously, I don't glass to the east in the morning because the sun's there and it's in my eyes and I can't see anything, but I don't think yeah. I've ever been strategic in glassing to set up in a way knowing that the sun's going to be coming up in the east, knowing that I want to be glassing to the west at that time. And so that's a that's a pretty good little nugget right there just to if you've got a basin you're wanting to glass you know elk are you need to find your glassing knob that faces away from the sun to uh, maximize your efficiency in glassing 
Yeah, and I should go into even a little more detail. Is When I do glass with my back to the south, mostly to the north, or it, I mean, it depends on which way the basin or drainage runs, but one of the benefits, if you can glass north, northeast, or northwest, is that as the sun comes up in the southeast, it's going to light up the slopes that are facing southeast. So those would be the slopes on the north and west side of the basin. It's going to light them up first. And those are the ones I'm focusing on heavily right at first light because those elk are going to get out of there when the sun hits them. But yet it gives me a little longer glassing period because the the uh, elk or deer, whatever it is, that might be on the the slopes on the east or southeast side of the basin that stays shaded longer because it takes a while for the sun to arc and start casting light in there so i can increase the amount of time i can spend in the same place and have good glassing periods by orienting myself there because the the slopes that get lit up first those animals disappear late or i mean early the, one, the slopes that stay shaded longer, the elk will stay out there longer. And that gives me a chance to maybe spot more elk. And if I see them, maybe get a chance to make a move on them. That's great. Great information. Again, I just, I don't do a lot of glassing. Um, so I don't have that experience of hunting elk from this point on. Most of my elk hunting is done by the end of September and, you know, maybe a little bit into October, but with my kids. And, and that's the beauty of Idaho. Idaho allows youth who are age 10 to 17. So Idaho split into two tags. We have an A tag and a B tag in most of the zones. And the A tag is primarily your archery season. And the B tag is primarily your rifle season. And of course, it they've got it, you know, a whole bunch of confusing different seasons in different zones. But the, the zone that we hunt an A tag, you can archery hunt uh, basically the whole month of September, so August 30th through September 30th. And if mm-hmm. you don't fill your tag, you can rifle hunt for a spike only from October 5th through the 14th. And if you still haven't mm-hmm. filled your tag, you can short range weapon hunt from, I think it's November 10th to the 24th for a cow. That's oh. all on the A tag. Well, the B tag. You can hunt for a cow or a spike during the first two weeks of archery. And then you can also hunt for a bull during uh, October 15th through November 3rd. And so, wow. you know, you choose which tag you want. If you want to focus more on archery, but still have some other opportunities, or if you want to focus mainly on rifle, but still be able to go out during archery season. Well, the youth in Idaho if they buy that zone tag, they get to hunt both the A and B season. So Ooh. my kids get to hunt all of September for archery, spike season with rifle from the 5th to the 14th, regular branch an- or bull uh, antlered hunt from the 15th through November 3rd, and then short range for a cow from November 10th through the 24th. So I'm definitely getting more experience in some of the late season and post rut hunting just because it's so much extended with with them and the tags that they get why why haven't you not told me about that long window of opportunity sooner (laughs) you've always told me ah nothing to see here move along move along i'm just saying the season's good i you know the wolves killed all the elk here in idaho so there are no Uh elk in idaho um yeah right it's it's all wolf country here now yeah, uh-huh, yeah. I <laughs> Everybody go to Montana. Been... Go to Montana. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a little bit of uh, deceit going on there. <laughs> huh, well, now I, you know, I should have trusted my research when Go Hunt listed all of these rather than pick up the phone and call Corey and say, well, what do you think of this? Oh, I, I wouldn't waste my time. I wouldn't spend my money if I was you. <laughs> Hmm? Now, now we know. <laughs> we do have opportunity in Idaho. That's uh, yeah. We're blessed in that so, regard. Uh, uh, I don't know how many or what other questions that we want to get into, but we got a whole gunny sack full of them here. Uh, this one is specific to rifle hunting, and or almost rifle. Yeah, we'll call it rifle hunting. It's from Stefan Hammer. 
And he says, I've grown up with my dad and I practicing and sighting in our rifles on public land and not at a shooting range because it's more like what we experience in the field. How do you practice and sight in? And can you find that practicing one way is better than another? And then also this one, I really enjoy the podcast. I just wish you guys would do more of them so I could listen more often. <laughs> <laughs> After you open this by saying we've struggled to have our paths cross, uh, I don't know if they're going to get more. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll so, uh, we've already got a plan in place to maybe not more, but at least keep our frequency consistent and. Yeah. Uh, so as far stuff. as sighting in on public land, that's one of the great parts about public land is most of the, at least most of the federal land I'm aware of, uh, BLM and Forest Service allows recreational shooting. Now be careful, in a lot of states, uh, Colorado, uh, Arizona, California, the state lands do not allow recreational shooting. I think New Mexico doesn't allow recreational shooting either. So you want to be a little careful in making sure you know where you're at when you're doing that. Uh, but I suspect this is probably targeted more at me, Corey, than you because you're the ace in the archery world. Uh, I have a range that I go to, and it's a controlled situation where we have set distances all the way out to 400 meters. You can go even further, but I go to the 400 meter range. And I try to practice as much field condition as I possibly can. I'll, once I get zeroed, I'm doing prone shooting. I'm doing shooting off a bipod, shooting off my pack, leaning against one of the posts that brace the, the canopy there, treating it as if it's a tree. Uh, sometimes me and the crew will do calisthenics or do other stuff to get our heart rate up. Uh, I go out a lot of times when it's really windy or it's raining or it's snowing, probably just like you do with your archery gear. You probably go out and shoot in the wind some just so you know what's what's my arrow do in these conditions. And I want to know the same thing when I pull that trigger on my rifle. So I, I think Stefan's point is great of uh, practicing in a place or manner that replicates the field conditions. For me, I I'm able to do that at a at a range and it just it works out good for me. But the the point I think he's making is uh you know or, or asking is kind of do I do this do I do the same thing? And, and I do just in a different place. And I uh so, sometimes I will go out and shoot on public land, not at my range, because I want to go to different elevations and see what that does to my my shot also. Totally. So, I think, you know, one thing that, that I would mention is there's nothing more frustrating than being out hunting and somebody down the road at the end of the road, they're sighting in their rifle while you're up on the ridge hunting. Um, so <laughs> while it is public land and you have every right to be there, be considerate of, of that yeah. if there's a hunt going on or, you know, you don't want to go into an area where you've been watching elk and go up on the ridge and start sighting in your rifle yep. right there. You know, go, go someplace where you're not going to hunt and try to be considerate of, of places that other people probably aren't going to hunt as well. If you're going to sight yeah. in your rifle out there on public land. Yeah. There's, there's plenty of places to go where you don't have to worry about disrupting someone else's experience. Yeah. Come, and come to Idaho. For, there's no elk here. So you can sight in anywhere. <laughs> in Idaho. Good to go. Uh, you know, Corey, everyone's going to detect BS in your statement there. And so uh, I think that it, it's very likely that you are uh, going to be inundated with applications next year <laughs> for Idaho because of just the deceitful way in which you're doing this. Oh, there's nothing to see here. Move along. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, I think we, right. I do that to every state I hunt. So it's just now it's a matter of trying to pick through and figure out which one I'm actually being honest about. Well... We'll uh, we'll let that one rest for now. But I think the point <laughs> is, and I, I to to Stefan's point, I think whether it's archery or rifle, yep, there's huge value in practicing the elements of w what is it going to be like when I'm out there in the field. Yep, and that's why I make you know 3D archery shoots in the summer a priority, and we base family vacations and everything around them to be able to go and and spend time shooting. You don't have to go to a 3D 
you know, sanctioned official archery shoot to, to get that practice. But, um, you're hiking the mountains, you have your backpack on, you're pulling up to a target, you're judging the distance, you're shooting it, trying to hit in the vitals. And, you know, it's as close to real hunting situation practice as you can get. And rifle hunting would be the same. You know, it's, you just, you definitely want to be very comfortable with your weapon and make it so it's basically an extension of you in any condition, angles up, down, you know, where it's hitting. Um, you know, we had a, a situation where I was hunting with somebody one time and, and the elk was a little farther than what I felt comfortable. We should have been shooting at it with a rifle. And, you know, I asked them what the ballistics were on, on the rifle and they really didn't know. And, you know, so basically at that point, you're just spraying bullets at at something, hoping to hit it. Whereas if you know the ballistics, if you know that elk's at 426 yards and you have 14.6 inches of drop, if you're zeroed at 300 and you're able to, you know, either you've got a a dead hold BDC reticle or you're able to hold over that 14.6 inches or you have a reticle you can dial right down to the exact yardage, you can make those shots and those aren't unethical shots. But when you don't know the, the equipment, when you don't know ballistics, when you don't know, you know, how all these factors affect your shooting, whether it's a bow or a rifle, um, at that point, you know, I think there, there are some questions of ethics involved of whether you should be taking that shot or not. Yeah, for sure. And I, one other thing that I do is I have multiple range finders and I seriously doubt that there's much variation among my range finders that I have are probably not even among different brands of range finders, but I don't take anything to chance. So the range finder I use out at the range is the range finder I use all season. So oh. if that range finder is saying 340, I know where my dials are going to be when my range finder says 340. I, you know, sometimes you can have a range finder that's slightly off so your crosshairs are going, you think straight ahead, but your, the crosshairs on your rangefinder, but your laser is going, say, one or two degrees to the right or to the left or high or low. And it's, so it's hitting something that is not the target you're on and you're getting false readings. And I check every rangefinder that we take out in the field, whether it's mine or whether it's a guest hunter's. And the easiest way to do it is take a telephone pole or take a, a tree that's, you know, 70, 80, 100 yards away and just move, hold the button down, move back and forth. And if you're getting a reading when that crosshair is not on that telephone pole, that tells you that your angle of your uh, rangefinder is not perfectly true. And you might want to get that fixed before you head out there because if your rangefinder angle, the laser angle is slightly off from the crosshair, let's say it, uh, the elk is out there 250 yards, but it hits a rock out there at 320 because it's going over the back of the elk or it's going to the right of the elk, you might miss. And so uh, the point of all that is also make sure that the rangefinder you're using when you're shooting and practicing, it's the same range finder uh, that, that it's sighted in, that it's adjusted and aligned properly, but it's also the same range finder you're using when you're out on the hunt. Absolutely. And yeah, to, to add to that, we've been at archery tournaments before where you can use a range finder and, you know, Donnie and I have two different style or two different models of range finders and his is about three yards off from mine at, you know, 45 yards really? or so. So he'll range it. And, you know, you're at these kind of shoots, you're free to talk about distance. You, everybody can use a range finder. And so, you know, somebody will step up and range it and say 45 yards. Everybody will take their word for it and step up and shoot it. But my bow might be sighted in for my range finder that actually shoots it at 48 yards. And three yards, you know, at that distance does make a difference. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's, you know, I would strongly back what you said that use use the range finder for practicing that you're going to use for hunting and don't rely on somebody else's because there are Ooh, discrepancies. Wow. I've seen the same range finder, two targets side by side, one black, one white read at three yards difference at 35 yards, just based on the color wow. and the, and the reflection that they're getting off of the laser off of those different colored targets. Yeah. Huh? Well, that's, um, 
hopefully that's not an issue for me because right now the rangefinder that's on my bino harness is there to stay until season's over. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and, and like you said, I, I don't rely on someone else's rangefinder. And not that I think uh, my buddy's going to sabotage me or, or give me a wrong reading. It's just, this is what I've been shooting all year with both my bow and my rifle. This is the one I have to use to make sure I'm consistent with what I've been practicing on. Yep. So. So, uh, do you do you think you have time to answer a question about scent control? I, man, I'd love to answer a question about scent control. All right. Jonathan Joyce emails this question. I know it's impossible to keep your scent down, especially when it's a hot archery season hunt. How do you all prepare your clothes and keeping your scent down when you're out on the hunt other than just using the wind? Did he really say y'all? You all. I said you, y'all. Oh, you I, said my y'all. Sister, my sister lives in Arkansas, so I, I, <laughs> when I talk to her, I start getting into this abbreviation thing, a y'all. So. <laughs> all right. Uh, I'll, I'll leave that to you. No, that's good. Um, so scent control, I hunt with stinky guys. Fortunately, I don't stink. They say I do, but I know that I don't. <laughs> but they stink, and, and I have to deal with that. There's really, I mean, when you're out in September and it's hot and you're going day after day, mile after mile, you're going to sweat. There's no way around it. Yeah. And we don't camp in a way that allows us to have showers or do much more. You know, right. we might take some little baby wipes or something and wipe our armpits and try to at least make it so we can climb in our sleeping bag without gagging ourselves at night. But we stink <laughs> and elk, elk can smell really well. So honestly, I don't do anything other than obey the wind and i've yeah. i've used products where we spray down you know some kind of a scent neutralizer um we've washed our clothes in certain scent eliminating detergents uh all these things but at, at the end of the day ultimately just in the 30 minutes you're hiking from before da- you know before daylight up to, to where you're getting to hunt you're going to sweat and you're going to produce odor and really if you're taking precautions and preparations, it's more for your hunting partner's sake because the elk are going to smell you one way or another. <laughs> it really doesn't matter. Just you have to keep the wind in your favor. Yeah, that's that's the only thing I rely upon. And I I get to be a little bit of a smart aleck when I get this question a lot of times on our Elk Talk Live that we do on Wednesday nights. I just say, you know what, if if you're spending money on any type of scent control product, send that money to your favorite conservation organization because it's going to do you a lot more good. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and, and I, so to Jonathan's question, uh, uh, my answer, and I think it's very similar to yours, is there really is no way in these hot archery hunts. You just, you accept the fact that you're going to be emitting a lot of odor and you better figure out how to play the wind. Yep. And I think, you know, uh, and w- the reason I asked if, if you said y'all is I think a lot of people from back east where, you know, in the south where y'all is a prevalent term, I think, you know, they're used to whitetail hunting where scent control, there, there are some things you can do to minimize your impact from a scent standpoint when you're sitting in a tree yeah. stand, you know, when you're, when you're not actively hiking. But when you take off hiking in elk country, you're going to sweat in September, especially in, most likely in October, November and any other time of the year because it's steep country and you're going to exert some energy and you're going to sweat. And so I think, you know, I've, I've definitely gotten to the point where I don't worry about anything other than the wind is everything. And that's, that's my approach to elk. And I'll take chances sometimes if there's, you know, a slight angle in the wind or the wind's swirling a little bit, I, I probably am too aggressive on that and take some chances and, and I probably shouldn't, I should back out or, you know, do something differently, but that's, I, I'm a hundred percent reliant on obeying the wind. Yeah. All right. Even in rifle season to the greatest degree possible, I'm doing the same thing. I mean, a, a funny story, <laughs> I don't know if I should tell this, but it's kind of, it's funny, but not funny. Uh, when <laughs> I love when stories, I love like, stories that start with, I don't know if I should tell this. 
Yeah, well, since I'm not the one at the point of the humor, uh, I guess Hunter to remain uh, anonymous. Hit an elk the night, uh, the second night of season, just uh, late in the afternoon. Followed it through the snow into a canyon. Uh, he wasn't sure what kind of hit he got, and uh, so. Uh, the, the bull beds in a canyon next morning at daylight, and this is where the whole scent and, and uh, play in the wind thing is. Next morning at daylight, they glass it up in the, in the same canyon, and it's bedded there looking quite pained. Well, they gauge the wind on top, start sneaking down in there, and the wind is just swirling like crazy. Somehow that bull smelled them, even though they thought, from where they were at, the wind was perfect. Bull gets up, walks a little bit out of the canyon lip onto a bench, and another hunter smokes him. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) Yeah, so this weekend, Marcus, our camera guy, films another hunter who we don't even know shooting an elk that he and our guest hunter were on the trail of. (laughs) Oh, man. But, again, gets to the wind and... And playing the wind, even in rifle season, is hard. Uh, they told me that that bull got up out of his bed at 650 yards, and they were sure the wind was in their favor. But you never know when that wind in those canyons comes one way and it hits a thermal and goes up the other side of the canyon. Uh, they, they said the bull couldn't see him. They're sure it probably didn't hear him. So, no, know, I've, I've mentioned before, I've been on a ridge watching elk in the spring out shed hunting you know half mile away from them way up above them huge elevation above them watching them across the other side of a canyon and knowing the wind's going that direction just not even thinking and all of a sudden seeing them lift their heads and look right up at us half mile away they know right where that scent's coming from and turn and run up the hill away from there so you know you get inside 100 yards 200 yards of an elk and you think that you're going to be able to fool their nose it's just, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Well, a lot of people try. Uh, <laughs> to, and I, I'm as guilty as anybody. I, don't, I would bet of uh, the, the many, many, many times I've screwed up an encounter, the majority, the overwhelming majority of those mess ups have been because I screwed up something as it relates to the wind. And I, having any type of scent control product or washing my clothes every day or whatever, I don't think would have made a difference. I screwed up, didn't play the wind properly, and the elk smelled me. Yep. And they will. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, how many more do we want to do here? You know, I think uh, we're on an hour and 20 minutes here, so we can probably uh, maybe pick one for a Sitka question of the podcast and... Come okay. up with a, a topic to discuss a conservation project through the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation and maybe wrap up this okay. episode. Okay. I'm going to ask this one of you. So you, you get to uh, answer the Sitka question of the week, and it comes from Drew Hampton. And uh, <laughs> we, we won't talk about the first part of it. Uh, he, <laughs> he says, uh, as of now, I have two opportunities to hunt. Uh, I have a choice of the week leading up to the fall equinox or the week after. After listening to Corey with his discussion of the phases of the moon, the second week would be September 22nd through 28th and a new moon. The week prior would basically be hunting the full moon, but it would be leading up to the peak rut and the fall equinox. What would you hunt? You know, that is probably the toughest combination um, to make a decision on because you've got the, the week leading up to the fall equinox, in my opinion, is going to be the best chance of calling in an elk, uh, as far as uh, compared to the week after. So you're going to have a a better chance of calling that week leading up to it. Um, you're going to have probably fewer people in the field, fewer other hunters. The elk aren't going to be as pressured as they're going to be a week later, so you've got some some really positive things going for you there. Uh, on the flip side, you've got the full moon. So you've got to deal with that. Yeah. That you know, If you have the full moon and you end up with hot weather, those elk aren't going to be out 
much during daylight. The good news is in a lot of places, you've got the midday calling uh, that, that I like to really take advantage of during a full moon. That that latter week from the 22nd to the 28th, you know, you're, you're getting out of the full moon, you're getting into a new moon, the elk are going to be more active longer into the daylight, uh, but you're also, the bulls are going to be herded up. The herd bulls are going to have cows, are going to be focused on breeding. The cows should be in, in full estrus at that point. So trying to call a bull away, especially a herd bull away from cows, is going to be more challenging. So you've got, you know, you've, you've got pros and cons. If you're strictly wanting to have the, the calling, uh, just that experience of calling an elk in and having him respond and come to your calls, uh, I would probably go for the, the week before the fall equinox, knowing that I would probably have to rely on some midday hunting and getting into bedding areas and hoping the elk are responsive and hoping that we don't have hot, dry weather. Uh, but man, I, I think uh, if if we were just kind of going blind and, and saying, let's go and hunt and we don't know where we're going, we don't know if the weather's going to be like, uh, I'd probably almost lean towards the 22nd to the 28th just because, you know, I'm going to have a little bit better chance of cooler weather. We're going to be out of that full moon. Um, I'm going to be able to adapt my style of hunting a little bit, still calling, but probably doing a little bit more what I call the hybrid, which is a, a mix between spot and stock and calling. So using calls to mm-hmm. locate the elk and then going quiet and slipping in on them while they're very active and very vocal. Uh, so I guess it would be a really hard one for me and it'd probably come down to what state I was hunting and what the, what the weather was looking like if I had that luxury of making a decision that late in the game. Yeah. Well, for me, as, as much of a headache as I've had to deal with, with hot weather, the last few hunts in September, I'm just going with the latest uh, dates I can find in September. Just and, and the only reason being is the likelihood of cooler weather. Yeah, and, no, and this I, this season has been, you know, I think we we get in the habit of saying this is the worst ever, or this is the hottest ever that I remember. This has probably been the warmest and driest elk season I remember hunting in a long time. And you know, we don't yeah. deal with drought necessarily in Idaho, Wyoming. Uh, the Oregon coast obviously is its own ecosystem and climate there. So that doesn't count, but here in Idaho, it's just hot and dry. There was no rain, no moisture at all. Uh, and I think it really truly had an effect this year on the rut and on the intensity of the rut, even in mountain States, which, uh, in the past, I felt that they're not as susceptible to the, uh, the effects of hot and dry weather nearly as much as a place like Nevada or Utah or New Mexico or Arizona, but this year I, I truly feel that the mountain states were affected by the hot, dry weather. Yeah. Well, for for me, uh, all the people who've contacted me have sat, had the same comment. This was the hardest archery season I remember in years. And I don't know what combination of whether it's moon phase, heat, drought, whatever it was. But as someone who's heavily into rifle seasons and we have, uh, let's see, five rifle tags to fill, I'm not complaining that all the archery guys left those elk still standing (laughs) out in the hills. (laughs) Uh, But anyhow, that's, uh, you, you, you didn't completely commit one way or the other, Corey, but you gave a good rationale for either of us. I, option. you know, I think I, I gave enough information that somebody could make a decision based on their hunting style. And, and that. I, I think if I was, if somebody put me on the spot and said, pick a week and you have to pick that week to elk hunt next year. And I'm not telling you where you're going and, you know, we don't know what the weather's going to be like. I would go for the 22nd to the 28th, just to get a little bit later, a little cooler weather, get away from that full moon. And, uh, again, knowing I'm going to have to adapt my, my personal well-liked style of run and gun calling a little bit, probably. Yeah. Well, we'll wrap it up with a really important part of the podcast. And that is, uh, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation's, uh, Access Elk Country initiative. And this is, uh, an example of what money gets used for 
with RMEF and you and I are I always focus on the access side because our public land situation just means that any group that's increasing access is doing a lot for us and people who hunt like us and the elk foundation does a lot of it this just this uh summer the elk foundation gave the wyoming game and fish department another fifteen thousand dollars which gets the total donation to this access yes program uh, while wyoming game and fish has this program called access yes uh, now over the last five years army f has donated ninety seven thousand five hundred dollars and some people may say well that's you know what what is fifteen thousand dollars what what does that donation this year do and scott talbot the director of wyoming game and fish said that that fifteen thousand dollar donation through the efficiency and effectiveness of their access yes program provides access to forty six thousand five hundred acres for hunting and angling in wyoming so it's it's just a, another way sometimes you don't have to go out and buy the land or buy an easement, sometimes you work with these state agencies that have really good programs in place that already have the great relationships with landowners or, or others to provide access. And this one, if, if you get a chance, go out to the Wyoming Game and Fish website and there's a tab called Public Access. And there you're going to have two types of public access under the Access Yes program. It's walk-in hunting or HMA, hunter management areas. And the walk-in hunting is just go park at one of the designated parking lots and put your backpack on and start hoofing it. The others, the hunter management areas, it's almost like a drawing in some of them. Some of them have such high demand that you have to put in for a drawing for one of the slots. Some of the other HMAs, you just go in, register, and say, here's my vehicle information. I want to pass for these dates, and and off you go. But it's a really, really effective program. And the, Wyoming is one of the big fundraising states for RMEF, so uh, the PAC money, they call it, Project Advisory Committee, which is funds raised in that state go to the project advisory committee and they get to decide what to do with it and so it's nice to see how this money rmef contributes can be leveraged so well by a group like wyoming uh, game and fish through their access yes program you know and i think you mentioned something there about the elk foundation the way i think that's one of the the most valuable things well it's hard to say most valuable but that's one of the the key things that I think a lot of people don't realize is how they work with other agencies. So they aren't necessarily spending out of their own pocket hundred percent. They're teaming up with agencies, whether it's fish and wildlife in different States or other groups who are, who are interested in conservation or interested in access and they team up with them and together are able to accomplish so much more. And I think just with their connections in that, realm of of being able to reach out and partner with these other groups and organizations is so powerful and key to uh, ensuring that we have you know all of these things we talked about access conservation um, easements all these different things that that they are uh, able to provide through the rocky mountain elk foundation yeah, a, a lot of these agencies and groups, they might have funding allocated, but what they lack is the infrastructure, the the staff and the resources to put deals together. And that's one of the things Elk Foundation excels at is they have a great staff from top to bottom. Uh, they're, they're people out on the ground out in each state or the people at the headquarters in Missoula that when they put deals together, a lot of these other agencies want to contribute and you end up leveraging your RMEF donations from anywhere from a one to three to a one to seven leveraging because the Elk Foundation puts the deal together, has the resources and the, when I say resources, the talent, I should say, to facilitate it. And they're the catalyst that brings it all together. And then these other groups take their pot of money and say, hey, thanks for doing that. We want to be part of it. And uh, it just, your money goes a long, long ways, I guess, is what we're trying to say there. Yep. Absolutely. <clears throat> and in mid-November, my son, having a Wyoming elk tag, we will be taking advantage, along with 
uh, a large number of other tag holders <laughs> uh, of on one of these HMAs. Uh, today, I logged into his account when I got home. I'm like, oh, wow, he drew one of the permits, one of the passes for the HMA. So we'll, uh, we'll be down there with a lot of other folks uh, enjoying it. I think over the course of our filming, we've taken four elk off HMA properties in Wyoming. And without the Access Yes program and groups like RMEF funding it, uh, don't know if we would have taken those four elk. Yeah, that's awesome. <clears throat> so with that, I think we're going to call it a wrap. Yep. I think uh, we've okay. bounced all over the place. We didn't go down too many rabbit holes. We uh, answered a lot of different questions of varied topics. So hopefully uh, something we said piqued some interest and got somebody thinking about a question they had or in some way helped somebody become a better elk hunter today. Yeah. And if they, if people listening to this want to add more questions, uh, where are the places that they can ask us questions? You know, I think You're the, the guy in charge of that, <laughs> <laughs> the, the best place is just going to elk talk podcast.com. I uh, just go to the website, click on the contact link and you can send us an email with your question. That way we have it in front of us. We've got a folder here with all the questions in it, so we can continually be looking through that and, and uh, drawing from there. Uh, be sure and, and like us, follow us, whatever it is on Instagram, um, and feel free to, to ask questions there. But those questions are probably going to be a little bit harder to incorporate into podcasts and probably less likely to get a, a direct answer from so uh, the website's good. Follow us, though, on, on Instagram for sure. And uh, keep, the, keep the questions coming. These are I actually enjoy getting questions and answering them because I feel like we're giving relevant information and answering questions that, that listeners have rather than just talking about what we feel is relevant or important. So definitely keep the questions coming. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. And the hard part is I'm surprised how many questions we get, but I'm thankful for every one of them. Yeah. But we, <laughs> we do get a lot of them. <laughs> and don't take it personal if we don't personally respond right. or answer your question. Like Randy said, we just, we get so many that we have to kind of pick through and, and find ones that we hope will uh, will cover the greater area of answering uh, questions that might be of most interest to the most people. Yeah. Well, Corey, thanks to you. Thanks to the audience. And uh, it won't be long. We'll be cranking out another podcast here. Hopefully I have a big story to tell one way or the other. Uh, with me, I'm, I can assure you it's mostly story uh, <laughs> and, and less of anything else. So. And I'm keeping all of my stories under wrap until uh, we launch Destination Elk here in a week or two. And and then we can yeah. really dive in and talk about details, but uh, you'll, you'll you'll understand maybe a little more after the videos start coming out. Uh, maybe the the real motivation behind not sharing quite so many stories yet. <laughs> uh, you're just being coy. Was that a suspenseful uh, teaser? Yeah. Where's <laughs> me? As quick as we get them done, I just throw them up on my YouTube channel, and we just let people watch them and the the day by day stuff that we do uh is a little bit more raw not not as polished and edited as our amazon stuff but it seems that people want to know a little bit more of the raw uh unedited no music just this is what happened boy randy you screwed that up <laughs> yeah i did <laughs> well i think that was our our whole goal going into this project was to take people along um, in the woods with us so they can see what takes place. And like you said, they can see the mess ups and the failures and, and all of that. So we're definitely, uh, we put ourselves out there and we, uh, we're going to live with it. Yeah. Well, I look forward to watching it. I, uh, uh, it'll be, I know some of the characters you had with you <laughs> and, uh, if you smooth it out too much, I'm going to call BS on you. I'm like, I know that guy. Yeah. That's not how that guy operates. Hold uh, on. <laughs> no, we aren't doing much. It's going to be like you said, raw day by day. So uh, there's not going to be a whole lot of polishing or editing, even though most of us need quite a bit of polishing. Yeah. 
Well, thanks for listening, everybody. Really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully you find something valuable in, in the time you spend listening. And please keep the comments coming because that's a big part of what generates the, the topics we decide to talk about. Yeah, and feel free to uh, leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to the podcast. Leave a comment on YouTube if you're watching them there. But uh, just anything you can do to, to add to what we're doing here and help other people get to see it, then uh, that'll ensure that we get to keep doing it and expand on what we're doing here. Sounds great, Corey. Awesome. Thanks, you Randy. Take care.